overall it was one of the best tunes I've ever done in my life. Because it was, frankly, it was a really tough experience. Keep in mind, this is all not just going to happen overnight. I think that that's really been instrumental in my career progression. Feels risky and scary. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And quite frankly, I think, you know, quick win is not necessarily going to be the most beneficial for you anyway. In this episode of the File Notes podcast, we spoke with Colin Levy, author, legal tech influencer, and in-house counsel. Colin's day job is director of legal and evangelist at Malbec, today's most modern and cutting edge contract lifecycle management solution. Outside of working in legal tech, Colin is perhaps one of the most followed legal personalities on social media, where he shares his passion for legal technology and insights from his career. Colin learned early in his career that he wanted to be an in-house counsel and quickly achieved that ambition, but not without facing challenges. Our conversation covers everything from growing up in Boston, deciding private practice wasn't for him, mental health in the legal sector, and of course, legal tech. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Colin. It's uh, really exciting to be able to speak to you today. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm really excited as well. Fantastic. Well, you grew up in Boston on the east coast of the US. I haven't actually been fortunate enough to visit yet, but what was Boston like growing up? Uh, that's a good question. Well, Boston is its a fun city. It's very tied to history because there's just a lot of colonial history tied to Boston with respect to development of America, and therefore it attracts a fair number of tourists. Uh, it's a it's a fun city to grow up. It's uh, definitely a lot smaller than some of our neighbors, more most especially in New York. And in that sense, it's more accessible to, I think, people because it's smaller, but it operates as if it's much larger in terms of le- uh, expense uh, to live there, traffic, and the weather off it, off it is always a topic of conversation uh, because it's so variable. Um, and the winters in Boston can be uh, somewhat harsh at times, or the last few winters haven't been that bad. But for the uninitiated, they can definitely be pretty cold and disruptive. I have to say, I've never had a white Christmas myself. I can imagine it gets pretty cold in Boston. I was looking yesterday and I was really surprised to learn that. Um, Boston only has uh, a population of something like 600,000, which, you know, uh, kind of growing up on American media, I just kind of suspected it was um, a whole lot more. It seems like a a really major city in the, in the context of the U S. Yeah. I think that Boston kind of uh, punches above its weight, so to speak, you know, our population is under a million, but in terms of our history and our presence, it's definitely pretty big, but yeah, in terms of population, definitely, smaller than I think folks from outside of the U S think. And I also think there's a tendency sometimes for those outside of the States to think every American city is like the size of New York, which is definitely not, um, not the case. (laughs) It just so happens that most of the major cities in and the U S um, on the East and West coast are fairly, fairly big. And most of the smaller cities are kind of away from the coast. But Boston is, I think one of those rare cities that happens to be on the coast, but in terms of, you know, pure population is not that big. Yeah, totally. Were you a reserved kid growing up or were you quite outgoing? What was that like? It's a great question. I was fairly outgoing, always eager to learn from others and build relationships with others. But I think that for a while I had convinced myself that I was somewhat introverted and that I found myself not necessarily wanting to be around people all the time. And I think that was more of just sort of the nature of me being around people is is tiring. So I love being around people, but I also very much value my space away from people as well, just to sort of refresh and, and slow down a little bit, which I generally don't have a great time of doing. Do you feel like that's changed as you've grown older? Yeah, I think I've I've definitely, I think, grown even more extroverted or at least been more openly self-acknowledging of the fact that I'm extroverted. But at the same time, I also think I'm realizing I, I do value being able to slow down a little bit. And while I value that, I'm not particularly good at actually following through on doing that. Yeah, definitely. I uh, can relate to that. 
Um, so before becoming a lawyer, you worked in a big law firm using tools to create e-discovery databases. What lessons did you learn about working at a law firm and like, how did that affect how you thought about your career? Uh, well, I learned, uh, number one, that not being in control of my schedule was not something I was very keen on accommodating because I was working long hours, never knew when I'd be leaving the office any given day. And it was very unpredictable. I also learned that I don't really, really didn't want to work for a big law firm, uh, for a number of reasons. One, I just didn't have a law firm mentality Two, I don't like wearing a suit every day. Three, I just generally found the the culture of at least the law firm that I was working for not particularly conducive to collaboration or advancement or growth. And so it just really was not an experience I wanted to repeat and certainly not one as, as a lawyer. Uh, that being said, it did give me exposure to technology and its role within the practice of law. And that certainly has become more and more prominent in terms of my career trajectory. Yeah. Had you thought about, um, what it would be like <clears throat> to be a lawyer, um, at a law firm beforehand, was that kind of your, your goal to, to go down like the traditional law firm route, um, before you had that experience? It's a good question. I, I had, I think given some serious thought to being a more traditional lawyer, generally speaking, and or working for a law firm. But I think that experience definitely compelled me to not follow that path, at least in terms of working for a, a law firm. Uh, but at the same time, I, I did at the time, and even during law school, I think, was was leaning towards a more traditional legal route. But I always had that little kind of nagging voice in my head telling me to kind of more explore a little more of this technology angle because of the amount of interest and excitement I had about that piece of it while working for the law firm and sort of my uh, view of the disconnect between the tech world and the legal world when I was in law school. Do you think that law school prepared you for what it was actually going to be like practicing as a lawyer? Uh, the short answer is no. I think that that law school was essentially three years of legal history it gave you a good sense of how the law came to be, how the legal profession came to be. But in terms of actually practicing law, it was definitely not adequate for preparing one to practice law in any way, shape, or form due to you know the lack of practical skills, lack of actually experience in the field, and the fact that most of law school is very theoretical and academic and not really focused on kind of the day-to-day -day life of a lawyer. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I think some of the essays I've had to write have been very abstract. My law essay I first ever had to write was, what is law? Which was quite a difficult one for the first one. And if you had a magic wand, how would you change the way that law is taught today based off what you know what it's like to be practicing as a lawyer now? I would make it, I think, a shorter experience. So I'd make it maybe two years followed by a third year of kind of out of field practice and or uh, just incorporating far more practical skills into every aspect of the law school curriculum, starting from even just entering law school. I think that while it's important to understand the basics, understand sort of the, the principles and theory underlying law, but I also think it would be great to have it be more interdisciplinary where you're not just learning about these principles, but also putting them to practice in different areas of law practice um, and incorporating technology into every part of the curriculum as well in terms of uh, using tools to complete certain legal tasks, what tools are better than others for certain legal tasks and so on. Uh, so I think all of that would be really helpful and help put um, sort of bring a little more practice into the nature of legal education. And I think there are some law schools out there that are doing a better job of it, uh, but there's definitely room for improvement. And I think certainly, you know, relying on law firms, at least in the U.S., to provide some of that sort of day-to-day -day tactical training for what it means to be a lawyer is woefully inadequate and also uh, not comprehensive and leave some lawyers, particularly those who graduate from law school, don't work for a big firm, 
pundit in the lurch with respect to uh, learning what it means to practice law as a lawyer. Yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of the points you've said there. And in 2018, you actually completed a certificate in legal innovation and technology. Could you elaborate on how your passion for technology intersects with your legal career today and how technology has influenced the legal at landscape in your perspective? Absolutely. Well, getting, you know, getting that certificate, I think, reinforced something that I had long felt, which was a desire to really dive more deeply into legal tech and into the intersection between tech and law. Uh, and I had long seen the need for there to be a closer relationship between, between the two, uh, in part because I saw the impact of technology upon other industries and how impactful technology had been upon these other industries with respect to their ability to use analytics and data, drive decision-making, drive revenue growth, drive increasing uh, their customer base and so on. And I really saw there to be a, a lack of that on the legal side. And in addition, I saw a growing gap between those needing legal services and those delivering legal services in terms of A, the types of services that could be easily accessible and B, the cost of such legal re, uh, services as well as accessing legal resources. And technology really has helped uh, close that gap in both respects. There's a lot more work to be done for sure. But certainly, I think we've seen technology play a huge role in helping close that gap and also, quite frankly, make the legal industry more aligned with the needs of business and more fluent in the language of business, which is data and metrics and analytics. While you were studying, you spent some time at the London School of Economics um, on like a bit of an exchange, um, obviously like a different environment and culture that's very different to the US. What was that like? Uh, that was probably one of the best years of my of my life. I spent a full year in, in London at the London School of Economics, and that was on purpose. Uh, I really wanted it to be a very immersive experience. I did not want to spend just a semester abroad. And while that was challenging and scary to some degree because I was uh, essentially moving to another country for a year, at the same time, I really wanted to be exposed to a different way of learning, a different environment, a more diverse environment. And I certainly got all of that and more with my time at the London School of Economics. And I also made some really, really good friends, both who are British as well as from other parts of the world while there. And it was really a life-changing experience in many respects. And it also was interesting in that the the curriculum and the way it was things were taught was very kind of, you know, you were essentially taught sort of the key themes and then it was up to you to really kind of teach yourself a lot of what was being thought of as sort of the core of each course. And that was interesting because it required a lot of sort of self-drive and autonomy. And that I found really invigorating because I really felt in control of my own education in some ways. And that was a lot of fun. So yeah, it was a fantastic experience. Love London. Uh, for a big city, I found it incredibly accessible and friendly. Uh, and the weather really didn't bother me at all because being from Boston, you know, the winter was actually warmer than in Boston and the weather really was not that bad. Uh, people often think of London as being kind of wet and dreary all the time, and it really wasn't. Um, if anything, it was particularly windy a lot of the time due to its location on an island. But other than that, it really wasn't kind of all that dreary or, or wet per se. Did it rain? Yes. Was it dreary at times? Sure. But it really wasn't kind of what I think a lot of perhaps Americans think of as sort of London slash British weather. Yeah, that's really interesting. I imagine um, it was a whole lot of fun and the learning experience, as you said, was quite different. Um, as a Kiwi, I uh, I was quite surprised by the degree of cultural differences between New Zealand, the US and the UK. I probably somewhat naively expected them, them to be really similar. Um, what kinds of like cultural differences stood out to you when you were studying and living over there? Yeah, uh, there, there are a number. I think one of them was sort of this, I think, expectation of a higher degree of maturity in terms of being in control of your education and really kind of taking control of how you were uh, learning, how you spent your time was very much more kind of up to you. There were no sort of, you know, attendance requirements, no sort of, you know, well, this, you know, you need to 
to have this done. Is it done yet? You know, you had due dates and you just had to submit stuff. And also found that the feedback overall was interesting in that even when the feedback was not necessarily fully positive, it was constructive and that there really were kind of actually detailed responses to how to improve things as opposed to, you know, just a simple grade or a simple, you know, this is good or this isn't good. And that I found particularly helpful as well. So I, I found there to be some degree of investment in the progress of, of individual students as well. Uh, in a couple of classes, actually, I was one of the few Americans in the class. And I found that to be interesting as well, because I was seen as a little bit of an anomaly and kind of seen as sort of a resource for folks to learn kind of what what it was like to be in the States. And that gave me a sense of there being a lot of misconceptions, I think, about the United States. Uh, and then the last cultural, I think, adjustment really was things just move slower in the UK than in the US. In the US, things move very, very quickly for the most part, both in terms of how people act, but also in terms of how agencies and government acts, even though government is slow in many ways. But uh, but the UK I found particularly people weren't really in a rush to do a lot per se. So that was definitely a little bit of an adjustment as well. Yeah, definitely. I think you'd probably find that um, <laughs> even more so in New Zealand, um, if you had the chance to come and visit. Um, uh, yeah. So after your studies, you, um, you knew you wanted to be an in-house lawyer, but you didn't have a job lined up. So you did temp roles to help you find your feet and land your first in-house role. Looking back at your career, both in these kind of early stages and more recently, can you identify any kind of roles or specific moments that you feel like had a profound impact on your professional development? Yeah, I think I think there were there were a couple. Uh, one was my first in-house role full time uh, had an impact, I think, because it was my first exposure to being a part of a legal team be dealing with fairly sophisticated legal matters and see uh, working for a global company with a lot of different entities in a lot of different countries. And that gave me a lot of interest, interesting exposure and also really gave me an inside look into sort of traditional lawyering because that was generally how the department worked. And that I found to be a little bit jarring. I also, however, as part of that experience, I uh, was part of a small team developing a preparatory in-house sort of really kind of bare bones contract review solution that gave me some insight into product development and into sort of technology and, and focusing it on a specific use case. And that was really interesting as well. And gave me some, I think, inspiration to continue pursuing my passion for the intersection of tech and law. Uh, so that was one experience. And then another, I think was uh, when I was working for, a large global learning company, I encountered probably one of my best mentors who I'm still friends with and is still very much a mentor of mine to this day, uh, who happened to be the general counsel of that company, who was very tech forward, very uh, supportive and encouraging of my exploration of tech. And that really was really, really influential as well, given that he really helped kind of me uh continue my passion and really helped me sort of stay on my, my desire to learn more about the legal tech space. Uh, and actually it was one of the first interviews I conducted for my, for my website that I've been operating that where I showcase interviews of legal and legal tech leaders. So very thankful for that exp exposure and for that relationship that still is uh, going strong to this day. Yeah, interesting. How did you find and like develop that mentoring relationship? You know, it really kind of just started with just me being bold and sending him a note saying, hey, you know, I'm starting this website where I interview leaders uh, within the legal and legal tech space. You know, I've been following your work. I really find it pretty interesting. Would you be open to being interviewed in a brief chat. So it started with a brief chat where he was able to, you know, spend, I think just like 10, 10 minutes with me or so kind of talking a little bit. And then we had another chat and then it developed into sort of just periodic chats we had. And then I interviewed him for the website and 
uh, just continued into this sort of mentorship because he was really passionate about helping me find my way uh, and and learning about the intersection of tech and law because he himself was learning as well, but very keen on encouraging younger lawyers to adapt and incorporate technology into their into their practice. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I feel like, you know, maybe there, uh, I'd love you to hear your thoughts on this. I feel like maybe there's um, unique challenges being an in-house lawyer where you're less exposed to those uh, relationships that can turn into, you know, uh, finding great mentors because you're often in smaller teams and maybe sometimes you're the only person working in the, the legal team in an in-house role. Um, yeah, have you found that to be true? And like, what kind of advice would you give to people that are looking to build mentoring relationships? So I think the best way to start looking for a mentoring relationship is to, you know, find people whose career trajectories and journeys you find interesting and take it upon yourself to reach out to them and ask for five, 10 minutes of their time for them to tell you about their journey and then ask, you know, listen to their journey and then ask questions and then, you know, propose maybe some follow-up down the road with respect to uh, learning more about their journey and, and so on. And that's really how I've developed these mentoring relationships. And that's how others have found me to, for me to mentor them as well. I think another way as well to kind of develop those relationships is, you know, if you've had particular you know, impactful teachers that have been useful, whether in law school or elsewhere, never hurt to stay in touch with them as well to learn more from them about about their journey and experiences. So I really think it just starts with kind of just outreach and just asking for a little bit of time for for them to tell you about their journey and their lessons learned. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You mentioned the first role a full-time role that you went into after you know moving through these temp positions um something and something i really admire about you is your openness and talking about challenges with mental health of course being a lawyer can be a pretty demanding role and i know that in your first full-time role you actually burned out and had to take time off to address you know stress and anxiety how did you recognize the need for this break and like what steps did you take to manage your mental health afterward? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think that the the sort of the the moment that I realized I needed that was when I, quite frankly, had a little bit of a breakdown and just realized, uh, you know, I'm not in a good place. I need a break. I need to kind of recenter myself, refine myself a little bit, and find tools to manage my anxiety and stress. And so or do that, I needed to take time off because I was just stressing myself out and seek out professional help, frankly, to find the tools within myself to help me manage my anxiety and uh, manage kind of my self-talk and, and manage how I was uh, dealing with my emotions. And that I found incredibly helpful. At the same time, it was incredibly challenging work because it forced me to really confront sort of, I guess you could call them my inner demons and sort of experiences that I've had when I was younger that led to some of this anxiety and stress. Uh, but overall, it was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And I still, uh, you know, have a therapist um, and, and see the person uh, periodically and on a regular basis. And it's incredibly helpful for me to just stay centered and and keep going. And, and really my purpose in being open and transparent about mental health is to a normalize it for others. Uh, in other words, let them know that they're not alone in how they feel. And B, it's really vital for us to acknowledge our feelings as hard as that may be and to not ignore them because our bodies are telling us something with our emotions and how we feel. And the more we try to ignore or push past them, the greater the likelihood of us doing harm to ourselves mentally or otherwise, which could make things far worse. So I think it's really important upon all of us to listen to ourselves and how we're feeling mentally and otherwise and address, you know, those times when we feel like we are losing ourselves um, because otherwise it could lead to far worse consequences. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I had a really similar experience years ago 
um, when I was studying before I started VXT, uh, I was trying to test myself. So I just added as many things as I could to my workload. Um, and I made it through like all of those tasks, but, you know, after I'd completed them all, my body just kind of gave up on me. And I, I had this like period where I, I really broke down and, um, you know, I had to go through this, uh, process of, uh, coming out of that, thinking about, you know, how do I actually manage my mental health? Cause it was frankly, it was a really tough experience. Um, but it helped me build like habits and um think about you know different methods to help me like manage that stuff and one of the things that i find really important for myself is um it's just going to sleep early and getting enough getting enough shut eye um what are some of the habits that you have found are really important in your life for that uh well certainly i think uh sleep is is super important and getting enough sleep is is important you know i think that uh, it's been shown through studies that your brain needs sleep to regenerate, needs sleep to thrive, needs sleep to uh, maintain itself. So I think that's super important. Uh, I also think that there are ways in which one can manage sort of their time better. In other words, if you're feeling tired or you're feeling kind of, you know, drained or whatever, give yourself some time to to take a break. I think breaks are important. Um, you know, though you can return to the work, but I think taking breaks is important. Actual breaks, meaning, you know, you're not working while you're on break, meaning you're not, meaning you should, you know, not work while you're on a, on a break. And also I think it's important to, you know, find ways to sort of express your feelings, whether it be, you know, for me, writing, it's been very therapeutic and also something I love to do. So writing for me is one way, for me to sort of express my emotions and, and get thoughts out of my head. Uh, so that's one thing that can be helpful. Uh, so can exercise for sure. Uh, but I think it's important for all of us to acknowledge sort of our feelings and, and know what we'd like to do and find ways to use those passions of ours to help manage our, our stress and anxiety. And I, I think that, you know, I'm going to be honest, you know, dealing with these issues is not, easy it's not fun but it's super important both for your short term as well as your long term health and uh, i don't think anything is more important than one's health mental and physical yeah it's the thing that like holds everything else up i suppose something you touched on there was um taking breaks and i know like it's a lot easier said than done because like people uh can often be really hard on themselves and i feel really guilty when they're not uh, working and um, you know, getting the next job done. I found that really challenging personally. And one of the ways that I manage that is um, thinking about breaks being like productive work um, and kind of like forgiving myself and, like, in, you know, intentionally going, hey, well, this break is actually going to make me more productive in the future and allow me to um, get back working um, you know, uh, better, faster and things like that. And so, um, of course, without taking it too far and um, excusing every break, I think it's a really important uh, way to think about things. Um, the legal industry, uh, of course, is super well known for long hours and a professional, maybe uptight culture, um, some would say. How do you think the law should change to help address like mental health issues like these? Well, I think there's a couple couple of different ways. One is that, you know, I think there's a tendency to kind of lose your humanity when you become a lawyer. And I think it's important for lawyers to acknowledge their own humanity because uh, they see them and their clients all the time. I mean, their clients are coming to them with problems. Sometimes these problems are very uh, emotionally charged. And I think it's important to kind of acknowledge that there are emotions in the room and the law cannot kind of just operate in a vacuum uh, and disregard sort of the emotions of, of people involved as well as those helping others, meaning the lawyers. So I think that's, that's important is to remember our own innate humanity and not kind of leave it at the door when we uh, either enter or leave law school or whatever our legal training is. Uh, I also think that in terms of, schedules 
you know, build, making a little bit of time for yourself to take a break or whatever is not such a bad idea. You know, a time in which you don't want, in which you won't take phone calls or, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be a long period of time. It can be just brief little periods of time throughout the day um, to try to just take a break, I think would be, would be helpful. And I also think law firms have a duty upon themselves to take care of their employees and, and address you know, and ensure that their employees are healthy and happy because they're the ones who are helping these law firms be successful. And so if the law firm wants to remain successful, it needs their employees to be successful as well, which I think often is seen as simply just working, working, working and not taking any time to take care of themselves. And I think that's detrimental to the employees, it's detrimental to the firm, and it's detrimental to the industry that, to your point, has always been seen, I think, has been sort of devoid of humanity in many ways, much to its detriment. Yeah, and I think if, um, you know, people really prioritize the well-being um, of their staff, you know, th there are lots of rewards that come from that, that business owners and partners and practice managers um, are looking for. And, um, you know, of course, you know, if your staff feel better, if they really, um, love the firm or the business that they work for uh they'll stay longer so they'll they'll be retained for longer um and they'll probably they'll care a lot more about the work they do and put in more effort and those are only good things for the people that are making the decisions at the top and so if we fast forward to your role today you're the general counsel at Melbeck and there you wear multiple hats including being their community and brand guy. First of all, could you explain briefly what Malbec is? And secondly, what a typical day at Malbec looks like for you? Sure. Well, I'll start with the second question first. There is no typical day. Every day is fairly different. Uh, one day could involve reviewing agreements uh, and writing a blog post. Another day could be uh, a boatload of meetings and perhaps a contract negotiation and or perhaps some, you know, training salespeople to work with me. Another day could be focused on, you know, writing a number of blog posts, participating on a webinar, uh, what have you. Uh, so every day is a little bit different and I love that. And then in terms of what Molbeck does, Molbeck is not in the wine business, even though we're named after a wine in part. Uh, we are a contract lifecycle management company. So we uh, create software to help companies, primarily legal departments, manage their contracts from uh, start to finish, meaning from drafting to negotiating to finalizing to tracking to post execution, such as renewals and so on, driven in part by AI, driven in part by data-driven decision-making and driven in part by automation. Uh, and I've been there now for uh, over three years, and it's been a really great experience to be part of a really fast-growing company that's dynamic, agile, uh, and very supportive of its people. Awesome. And could you shed some light on how you balance your legal responsibilities with the community and business side? What does that split look like between those? And is there quite a lot of interlink between them? So there's a number, there, there are some overlaps in terms of the relationship building and sort of the content driven marketing elements of my role. Uh, and then in terms of kind of, you know, the day-to-day -day work, you know, it's, it's largely sort of contract transactional driven, but it's certainly aided largely by our software solution, which I use myself, which is very helpful. Uh, and it's really a lot of fun to be part of this community of, of legal tech professionals that are helping others with their, with their work. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's been really, you know, fun, fun experience and, and Malbec in general, I think takes a very user centric approach to how we provide solutions and, and all of that. So there's, there is a fair degree of overlap between, uh, the two areas. And then, of course, there are some sort of more legal focused areas, such as, you know, actual drafting, negotiating agreements or uh, updating policies and procedures and so on. 
And so when you're working in-house, you certainly get exposed to a broader range of matters than you would if you were specializing in a niche at a law firm. And that would often mean working in new areas that you don't know that much about, perhaps. What does it look like when you might need to collaborate with external counsel? Yeah, so generally speaking, when I'm collaborating with external counsel, it tends to be on fairly focused areas of law, like IP, patents, things like that, which I don't have as much expertise in and need the expertise of others, uh, which largely I think reflects kind of how law firms operate is they provide sort of specialized services for different areas of law. Sometimes you may use a law firm for a variety of different areas, uh, but in my in-house experience, I've generally sought outside help for really specific niche areas uh, that I don't have a lot of expertise in. Uh, but in general, I try to kind of be a generalist and learn as much as I can about all these different areas, to try to assist to the degree to which I can before seeking uh, the help of outside counsel. And what are some of the practical steps or habits that you rely on to keep up when you have to work across such a broad area? So number one is, is reading blogs, books, websites, whatever whatever I can get my hands and eyes on uh, to stay up to date. Uh, so that's, that's number one. Number two is conferring with friends, colleagues, coworkers about things they're working on or things that they may have posted about online or things that they have been asking me about that I then want to ask them about. Uh, so a large part of that sort of collaboration and learning occurs through, um, you know, using the existing relationships I have with others and building new ones as well. Career progression at a law firm is very different to in-house and maybe in some ways quite a lot clearer. How do you think about advancing your career when you're in a small in-house team or perhaps the only lawyer at the company? So I'm always thinking about ways in which I can bring more value to my role. Uh, so whether it be through you know, learning more about an area of increasing importance to the company, like, for example, data privacy, which is always important. Uh, becoming more well-versed in those issues is one way in which I can bring more value. Or being or staying up to date on, on current best practices with respect to a particular area of law that is in high demand at the company. And or um, getting really familiar with the the products and services that the company sells and then being a part of more meetings that are part of, you know, that are involved with, you know, product development efforts, marketing efforts, whatever, because I think the more involved you are and the more sort of embedded you are in the company, the more value you can bring, the more you're seen as a value added member. Uh, and also the more you are seen as someone that is not just valuable to the company as a source of knowledge, but valuable to others as well, because you've been exposed to these different areas and have, sort of a growing base of knowledge with those areas that others may not necessarily have as much exposure to. So I think that's really a key way to build value and, and kind of build your, you know, career development plan. Uh, and, and part of that as well, at least for me personally, is, is also building your personal brand in terms of sharing your experiences, your thoughts, what lessons you've learned through your experience with others. And the likelihood is others will have had similar experiences or perhaps different experiences and engaging with others is a way to put yourself out there as someone who is involved, knowledgeable, and eager to learn and grow. And that can often create opportunities for yourself and open doors you didn't know exist for new opportunities. And to stay up to date with all of the new developments in law, how what resources do you go to? Do you read books? Do you go to conferences? Or what does that look like? Yeah, so uh, conferences are, are one way to learn more, although for me, generally, they tend to be more of just sort of engaging with others that I've built uh, relationships with. Uh, but reading blogs, for sure, uh, is very helpful, a variety of them, uh, not just about legal tech, but about other areas as well. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, so blogs and websites, really. And I also read a number of different books as well. Uh, I'm a little bit of a book hoarder, admittedly. Uh, so I tend to have more books than I've been able to read at any given time. Uh, but that's also another way for me to to learn about uh, a lot about the space. And then lastly, something I mentioned earlier is engaging with others to just hear about their journeys and learn more about them. 
uh, through brief conversations. That's also how I stay up to date and learn more about what is currently going on in the space. Yeah, I find like I have a similar experience in, in my role. Um, a, a lot of the most valuable learnings I get are from uh, talking to other people in different companies uh, in different areas. So if you were working at a law firm, you know, you, it might be easier to, um, you know, look up uh, to your know, senior leaders at your firm, you know, these positions like partner, um, senior solicitor, um, senior attorney, um, and go, hey, like, that's the target I want to shoot for. That's the role that I want in a few years' time. What's, like, is there a similar, um, you know, thing uh, when you're working in-house? Like, do you have, like, a specific role in mind that you want to get to? Or what does that look like? So there is sort of, I think, a, a traditional trajectory for in-house where you go from sort of, you know, counsel to you know, senior counsel to managing counsel to general counsel. Uh, I think though, for certainly in my experience working in tech companies, the, there's not necessarily a clear trajectory. It's just kind of a matter of where you best fit in in terms of your experience and then what you're passionate about and what you want to learn more about. So I, I'd say the trajectory is not necessarily as clear cut as it is in a law firm. Uh, and that can be, I think, a little bit confusing for folks. But at the same time, there's so many different opportunities to learn about so many different areas when you're an in-house attorney because of your closeness to the business and the fact that you are part of a business that, you know, is touching upon all these different areas. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities to learn. So my suggestion to kind of advance your career is to take advantage of those opportunities to learn and really uh, learn more about others and engage with others and other functions so that you can learn more about what they're up to. And the more you can do that, the more you're seen as someone that is eager to learn and eager to be involved. And therefore, you'll likely be more turned to and relied upon as a resource because they've seen your level of involvement and interest in what they're doing. Yeah, interesting. And there are probably, I mean, you, you talked about how you went from having this experience working in law firms um, deciding you wanted your career to be in-house um, and you started working in-house really early on in your career. But what about um, for lawyers who maybe are working at firms today, um, maybe it's really early in the career or they, maybe they're five years, 10 years in and they're interested in transitioning to um, become an in-house counsel. What advice would you give to them? and making that transition? So my advice would be threefold. One is to kind of evaluate um, and sort of ask yourself and answer for yourself the question of why, what it is that is compelling you to want to possibly look at the in-house world. Use that answer then to guide your evaluation of potential opportunities in terms of you want to be more, you know, you want to be closer to the business. You want to be more involved in a variety of areas, perhaps there's a particular industry you're interested in that you really want to focus in on, or you, you know, are, you know, tired of kind of the lifestyle of the big law firm and you want something that's a little bit different, or perhaps you're interested in startups or, you know, there's a lot of different answers to the question of why, but I think you start with asking yourself that question and answering it. And then secondly, based upon that answer, then kind of Look for folks, either you know or you want to get to know, who have roles that are aligned with your answer to the question of why. In other words, they're doing things that are you're interested in doing. Uh, they're working for companies you're interested in working for and doing things you're interested in, in doing at that company. And, and, and learn more about them, follow what they're doing, perhaps even engage them, see if they're willing to give you a little bit of their time to tell you more about what they're up to. Uh, I think that we're all willing to to spend a little bit of time to share more about what we're up to and have others eager to learn about what we're doing. And then lastly, I think, and this is something that perhaps uh, is challenging, but I think is also important to do, is to start thinking about your personal brand. What it is, the what's the story you want to tell to others about what you do, what you want to be doing and why? And then kind of use that sort of framework to help frame yourself on 
LinkedIn and elsewhere, wherever your information about you is found to let others know kind of the story you want them to know about you. And that may potentially lead to future opportunities. It may lead to people that are interested in learning more about you because you've got an interesting story to tell and therefore they want to talk to you and learn more about you and that may lead to new opportunities and so on. So I, I think that's kind of the three pronged approach I would take. And also, you know, keep in mind, this is all not just going to happen overnight. So you have to be focused, consistent, and patient in many ways and not expect all of this just to happen kind of over the course of a week. Uh, but over the course of, you know, a number of, perhaps a number of weeks, maybe even a few months, what have you. So you really want to stay focused and dedicated, but the more work you do internally about yourself and knowing yourself, uh, I think the better off you'll be going forward because you'll be more focused in terms of your efforts. Yeah, something um, that's been a really consistent theme through our conversation is the value of kind of intentionally connecting with people to learn from them, um, to understand areas that you might not generally be um, involved in. Um, and as you touched on, like a, a great way to connect with other people can be uh, through social media, engaging with other people online. Obviously, uh, Colin, you've got a big presence on social media, on LinkedIn um, and other platforms. How did that start? Was it something you were doing intentionally? So it did start intentionally. It started off with me kind of viewing LinkedIn as a, as a digital resume. And then it transformed itself over time. I saw it. I saw the platform become one where I could kind of tell the story I wanted to tell about myself and also engage with others. So it started off as a digital resume. And then I started commenting on people's posts because I just wanted to kind of test the waters and share some thoughts I had. And then I grew up the nerve to start posting myself. And I just, I, I really liked it. I liked sharing my thoughts. I liked connecting with others. And so I just continued to do it in a focused and consistent manner. And it just kind of gradually grew over time to what it is now. And I still love it. I make a routine, you know, I have a routine now for how I handle it and how I deal with it. Uh, and I think that that's really been instrumental in my career progression uh, and likely will remain the case going forward. Uh, and I think the key to it really has been being consistent, being focused and making it really clear kind of the story that of you and making it clear to others what that story is. And LinkedIn, thankfully, allows for you to be able to do that for a variety of ways, including, and most importantly, through your individual profile on the platform. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges um, can be putting yourself out there. It feels risky and scary. Um, but I think the hardest thing for people is often deciding what to post and um, you know, thinking about that content. If... I want you to, um, you know, kind of rewind back to when you were really early in this process of building your online presence. Like, what what are the steps that you took to go, hey, this is the kind of content I'm going to post. Like, this is exactly like this is what I'm going to write. What what was that process like? Uh well, I don't think it was necessarily, at least in the beginning, sort of a systematic process so much as it, it was a desire to express my interest in learning in especially about legal tech and learning about those who are working within the space, whether it was teaching about it at law schools or elsewhere or creating their own products. And so, you know, because I had that desire to engage with others that led me to lurk, looking for people who were doing things in the space, commenting on their posts, following them, and then using kind of those comments and their responses in their posts to inspire me to post myself. And so that's kind of generally the process I took. Now, I will say, because I've always had a passion for writing, writing definitely, you know, is a part of it and, and was fun for me to do. Uh, and I understand it can be nerve wracking for people, which is why I suggest not necessarily starting off by posting, but just commenting on, on people's posts and just sharing a few thoughts, even if it's just a supportive you know, I found this really interesting. Thanks for sharing something like that. It doesn't hurt because people notice that uh, and take note of it. And the more you're seen, uh, the more visible you become and the more people become interested in what you have to say. So 
that's kind of been what I've, uh, you know, the approach I've taken in general. But again, the most important thing I think respect to LinkedIn, especially is that uh, it takes time. It's a, it, it's a really a long-term project and it's not something that's just going to occur over a short period of time. So if you're looking for a kind of like a quick win, so to speak, that's not, you know, going to be the best approach. And quite frankly, I think, you know, a quick win is not necessarily going to be the most beneficial for you anyway. And so you mentioned earlier on that when you were younger, you started interviewing a lot of people about legal tech. And initially you started posting a lot of these insights on your LinkedIn. And that eventually led to you writing your own book, The Legal Tech Ecosystem. What is the book about and why did you write it? Sure. Well, I, I it grew out of a desire to inform and inspire others about legal tech. So the book is a non-technical accessible introduction to the world of legal tech. It takes a thematic approach. It kind of addresses different key kind of themes of the legal tech space. And I quote uh, from a number of people that I've spoken with in this space, in the book, to help kind of illuminate some of the principles and ideas that I talk about in the book uh, with respect to legal tech. So it's really intended to kind of be your accessible high-level introduction to the space to help inspire you to want to learn more about different areas uh, within it. Because, you know, I think any any legal tech book, it's going to be hard to cover kind of the entire waterfront of the space. So the intent of the book really is to provide the legal professional, whether it's a law student, a young lawyer, or an experienced lawyer, uh, a way to kind of learn about the world through a non-intimidating, down-to-earth approach. Uh, and I really hope people, um, you know, approach it with that mindset and find it useful and inspiring. So where can people find out more about your book? So the book is uh, available through Amazon widely. Uh, they can also find a little bit more about the book on my website, colinslevy.com. Awesome. And you, in your book, you kind of touch on legal technology and one of the challenges people often face um, in legal tech, whether they're in a law firm or maybe a, a in-house counsel, is advocating for and implementing new technology, especially when there's people in the businesses or the firms that are maybe a little bit more resistant to change and risk averse. Based on your experience, do you have any advice for individuals trying to promote um, this change in a legal context? Yeah, I think the best way to promote it is to approach it through um, personalization. You know, tell tell stories about about how the change has impacted you, use stories to kind of really tell the tale because I think people relate to stories more than kind of just amorphous, you know, statements that are isolated from themselves or from kind of the, the world. So I think storytelling is a, is a key way to illustrate and show the change and encourage others to change as well. And I think also being authentic and, and true to yourself about, you know, the challenges you face as well can be particularly helpful uh, because the likelihood is that the challenges you faced uh, are reflected by others' experiences. Yeah, and I think people can probably feel a little bit burnt out sometimes when people exclusively focus on the positive, the positive side of change, whether it's about technology or something else. And it can be really, it can be really nice and uh, uh, build trust when people honestly address kind of challenges they face and challenges that might come when trying to bring about this change. So to wrap us up, Colin, I've got a quick fire round for you. So what I'm going to do is I want to ask you a few questions and I just want you to come back to me with the first thing that comes to mind. So starting off, what would your dream job be if you weren't a lawyer? Mm, probably a writer. Yeah, I think that, that comes through. And in the con in the uh, context of writing, could you recommend a book to the audience, but it can't be your own? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I would say um, Tomorrow's Lawyers by Richard Susskind, uh, probably be a book I recommend because it's been a book that has inspired me and countless others with respect to adaptation and recognizing the role the changing role of the lawyer in a dynamic tech driven world. And what single thing would you change about the law? Make it more humane and human focused. 
Yeah, I think that's something we've heard a lot. What advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your career? Uh, I would say be less driven to conform and be more true to yourself. Finally, I think you'll like this one. Um, London or New York City? London. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Colin. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's been fantastic talking to you and I've really enjoyed uh, learning from your experiences. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Colin. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of File Notes. To keep up with the latest episodes and content, follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube at File Notes Podcast. You can also visit us on our website at vxt.co.nz forward slash podcast forward slash file notes to subscribe to our email list and never miss an episode. That's vxt.co.nz forward slash podcasts forward slash file notes. See you there.